Thank you all. Thank you guys. Great music. Helps to have it on. There we go. The title of today's message is Jesus Freaks. So freaks. Uh, now we know there's such a thing as a freak off. Uh, so if something is a freak, you can see a freak at the fair. All kind of freaks in the world. But what's a Jesus freak? Give you a little definition. A positive connotation would be a devout believer. It can refer to someone who openly expresses their love for Jesus and actively shares their faith with others. An enthusiastic worshiper. It may describe individuals deeply involved in church activities, worship, and community service. Negative connotation, radical. It can be used pejoratively to label someone whose expressions of faith are seen as excessive, overzealous, or out of touch with mainstream culture. Fundamentalist, in some context, it might imply a strict or dogmatic adherence to Christian beliefs that might alienate others. Let me read you a few quotes, one by Charles Spurgeon. I love Charles Spurgeon. If you're not willing to be criticized for your beliefs, you do not truly believe them. John Stott, we must be prepared to suffer, to be misunderstood, to be excluded, to be rejected. We will not be popular. A.W. Tozer, the man who is truly devoted to God will find that he has no choice but to be radical. Eugene Peterson, the Christian life is not a quiet escape to a garden where you can look at pretty flowers. It is a dramatic adventure in the service of Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis, Christianity, if false, is of no importance, and if true, of infinite importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. Richard Rohr, radical love will always be met with radical resistance. Now, I'm kind of hammering this out for myself, so you're going to have to go with me a little bit, but let me kind of make this statement. As you close in on the cross, you alienate religious people and the culture at the same time. So we think, oh, if I live the Christian life, then the world's going to hate me. If you truly live the Christian life, the religious world will hate you as well. All you got to do is have somebody show up at church, a dead church, a cold church, a stiff-necked church, and they come in and they met Jesus, and they're lit up. They're a freak show. They're talking to everybody about Jesus, how much they love Jesus, how he changed their life. They went from darkness to light, the power of Satan to the power of God, death to life. They're on fire. And we say, ho, 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 well, you know, that's okay at the beginning, but that'll, that'll come down. We need that to come down because we're not those kind of people. We're not Jesus freaks. And so then that person looks around and goes, okay, so what am I doing wrong? This is not how you're supposed to live. That's exactly who you're supposed to be. And the church puts fire extinguishers on the fire and gets everybody to calm down to their level and then nothing happens. We, it's like our kids get excited. Oh, don't get too excited. Well, that's a childish thing. Maybe it's a childlike thing and maybe it should never go away. Maybe our wonder and, and, and wow of who God is and, and what he's done for us and in us and through us, maybe that should never go away. So if you live that life in a church, if that church is, is dead, you're going to die with it or you're going to get out of there. And if you go into the culture and you're on fire for Jesus and the culture says, hey, dude, calm down. We don't mind you believing some stuff, but don't be bringing that into the workplace. We, we don't need you all lit up. You're, you're making a scene. You're a freak show. And then you go, oh, if I'm going to succeed, if I'm going to make money, if I'm going to be successful, all these things that our culture 
says are important, then you go, well, I better tone this down so that I fit in. A Christian is not supposed to fit in. They're supposed to stand out. They're supposed to make a difference. There's one golf clap-ish. So you say, well, what will happen to me if I do this? What happened to Jesus? He shows up and you say, well, everybody loved Jesus. No, they didn't. You say, well, it was just the religious people that didn't love Jesus. No, it wasn't. The Romans that didn't love him. People that loved Jesus loved Jesus because they figured out who he was and what he was about and that there was something totally different about him and they wanted, they wanted him. They wanted what he had, who he was, what he stood for. They recognized that he was God in a man and that he could change their lives, not just heal them, not just feed them, but he could change their lives. And so you say, well, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm telling you, you may not be. I may not be. Followers of Jesus go where Jesus goes. They do what Jesus does, not behind him, but within you. And I speak of this all the time. I met with a guy just the other day. He came in and he, he, was, he was on fire. So He may be in the room. He was so on fire, had wasted so much of his life. He had finally gotten things screwed on with Jesus. And he couldn't even talk about him with his, without his eyes watering. Like tears in his eyes on the verge of weeping because he understood that God loved him and he loved God. And so now he finds himself in situations and it, it just comes up. So you say, well, I'm not, I'm not a Jesus freak. I know. It's obvious when you are and when you're not. You say, well, is that a good or a bad thing? I don't know. You tell me. Now, there are churches you can go to where it's a freak show, and they all crank, they, they put their freak on at church, right? They're all doing all the stuff that you're supposed to do to look like it, and then they get out of there and loosen it all up, get in the car and go, man, I'm glad that's over, get back to my life. This thing should be seamless. It should be every day. You say, well, sometimes I have a bad day. Then tell a person that. If I'm rude to people and I'm, and I'm a believer and I go, you know what, man, I got to apologize. I know better than this. I, I, sh I shouldn't be treating you this way. I apologize. I was rude to you. And here's why it's such a big deal to me to tell you this. Because I'm supposed to be out here loving on you, not alienating you. I'm supposed to represent not me, but him. Okay, let's read some verses. Isaiah 29. Now, I got a ton of verses. I chopped a bunch out. I feel bad when I do that. So some of this stuff, if you're taking notes, you need to write down the reference and go read it later. I'll refer to it, but I'm not going to read the whole thing. At least I don't think so. Um, Isaiah 29, 13. And this is Old Testament. Look at God, how he's interacting with his own people in the Old Testament. Therefore, the Lord said, inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths, they say God things and honor me with their lips, speak highly of me by what comes out of their, their, off their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me. So it sounds like... You know, you can sing Jesus loves me and that you love Jesus and all these words come out of my mouth, but where is my heart with those words? Are you just singing songs or do the songs originate in your heart and overflow from your heart out your mouth and people hear it and see it and go, wow, that, that person really loves God. How many people don't even show up for music? I, I just want to come for the message. What do you think you're going to do forever in heaven? Listen to me preach? No. Now, God may be kind to give me my little planet out there somewhere and I can just go at it by myself, but um, heaven will be about worship. It'll be about him. 
They honor me with their lips, but they have removed their hearts far from me. And their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. So they have, they have people, t- you should fear the Lord. Not, you don't fear him, you don't have awe toward him because you have awe toward him. You're told that you're supposed to, so that's why you do. Not from inside out. Therefore, behold, I will again do a marvelous work among this people, a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of the wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. In other words, I'm going to do something. I'm about to knock your socks off. Look at Mark chapter, uh, well, same thing, just make a note. That's, it's quoted in Mark chapter 7, verse 6 and following. Um, And he quotes it here in verse 8, and he says, For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and, and, and other such things you do. So let me say this. Let's just, let me take a deep breath before I say this. Leave people alone. If someone comes in with a hat, leave them alone. Oh, take your hat off. You're in the house of the Lord. You are not in the house of the Lord. We are the house of the Lord. That means you got a hat on the house, not in the house. you're a Christian well but she she showed up in that tight skirt and it's a distraction to my husband sit closer (laughs) don't sit back there where you can see her I'm gonna have everybody in the front row now (coughs) well these people should know better than to come to church looking like that I mean like you (coughs) from the inside out all messed up And we wonder why people don't want to come back to church. We're so busy sizing them up from the outside, we don't don't even know what their heart is. Tattoos. Just crazy stuff. Oh, you can't wear pants. Well, you can wear pants on Sunday night, but not Sunday morning. It's just all crazy stuff. We got to dress up on Sunday morning, but God doesn't care. He goes casual at night. Like he's dressed, he's not changing clothes. He does not care. You say, well, why do you always wear like the same shirt and the same pair of pants? Because we got got homeless people that come in here, and if they come in here and go, wow, I don't look right, I'm trying to make them feel comfortable. Go, we don't care. I can wear the same thing. You got the same thing. I can wear the same thing. It's not about your clothes. It's about your heart. (laughs) Churches are nuts. We come up with all these things, reasons why people can't participate in their gathering. And by the way, the Bible excludes people from participating. I'll read you these verses. The Bible targets Christians from participating in the gathering, not non-Christians. Isaiah 53, 3. Look what the Old Testament prophesied talking about Jesus. He is despised and rejected by men. You think everybody loved Jesus. They did not and they do not. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. So you think, well, I want to be like Jesus. Then it's not going to be fun all the time. Matthew chapter 15 verse 8. Same thing back from Mark. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. So saying with these rules that we come up with, these are doctrines. Man, be careful what you make doctrine. Tradition is not doctrine. Right? Well, we've always done it this way. If it's not in the book, it, it, you can let it go. It can come and go. Matthew 23, verse 27. Now, you think Jesus is always nice? Uh, it appears that Jesus freaks every once in a while. I'm not saying he does, but... Matthew 23, verse 27, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. There's not much harsher language you can use on on a person or a group of people. Woe to you, warning to you, basically. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. 
For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Now you say, well, why, where does that work? That only wor- hypocrites only work around hypocrites. So if you fill a whole church with hypocrites, don't ask, don't tell. I'm a hypocrite, you're a hypocrite, but we're not going to call anybody out. We'll just be hypocrites. And we'll call it worship, we'll call it church. We'll sing our songs, read our scriptures, but we ain't doing any of this. We are full of dead men's bones. It's not righteousness. And then you leave there and go, maybe still continue that hypocrisy. Let me tell you something. The world is not buying our hypocrisy. They are sick of it. They see it and go, hypocrite. You say, well, then what should I do? Be real. Be transparent. If you struggle, tell people you struggle. We pass around microphones in here during the service. For what purpose? See what's going on. Every once in a while, someone says, man, I'm struggling with this. I go, wow, now we're having church. Because it's real. Life is not always good. It's not always easy. Sometimes it's praise the Lord, but it's a sacrifice of praise. It's costing you something because you don't want to praise him because it's, you're in pain. It's a sacrifice of thanksgiving because you've had a loss and you're thanking him anyway. Go read Mark chapter 3. Heals somebody on the Sabbath and they completely freak out. Man, I grew up, you couldn't do jack on Sunday. I mean, I, I wish somebody would make me go home and take a nap now. I mean, that's what I had to do when I was a kid. <clears throat> you couldn't play cards where I was from, but you could play dominoes. <laughs> you weren't supposed to smoke, but if you're a deacon, you could smoke outside by the steps. I guess that meant you couldn't smoke in the building. And so you figure out all this crazy. You're supposed to wear certain clothes and women can't wear pantyhose. I mean, they, those don't even exist anymore, do they? Anybody know what those are even? So that's one of the shocks when I got married. I had no idea. That, that stuff's expensive. Man, you just want to tell your wife, be careful putting those on. Those are like $7, man. Be careful. And there, you know, there's no repair shops to drop them off at. My wife destroyed these. Could you patch these up here just a little bit? Either you had to wear them or you couldn't wear them. Just crazy stuff. And the world goes, okay, so you're invited me to your church. Like, okay, so tell me, I got to go buy a whole new uniform. No, just come like that. And then we go, oh, no, that won't work. Mark chapter 8. Now, I'm reading you these verses about Jesus, but I'm telling you, if you say, well, I'm signing up to follow Jesus, this is where he's going. This is what it's like in Jesus' world. And he, uh, Mark 8, 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes. And be killed. And after three days, rise again. So you say, well, that sounds great at the end, but look what what you have to go through to get there. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to be rejected. I don't want to die. I don't want to lose me. But he says, well, if you hold on to your life, you'll lose it. If you lose it for my sake, you find it. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Jesus goes to Nazareth where he was brought up. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, stood up to read. And I have been in this synagogue. It's a crazy thing and just ruins of it. But I'm like, it's a a strange thing to be in, in in ruins even where like Jesus stood right there and read this. 
And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, and no one had ever said this, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I'm the guy. So all who bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth, and they said, now listen, you see that? They marveled at at the gracious words that were coming out of his mouth. Now watch this. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? That's Jesus, like, that's Jesus, it's it's, it's Joseph's kid. He said to them, you will surely say this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard heard done in Capernaum, do also here in, in, in your country. We hear you're a big dog. You do all kind of miracles. Okay, do a trick here. Then he said, assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, they went from gracious words, wow, now they're saying they are filled with with wrath, now they're angry, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. And I've stood on that cliff, and he would have died. So you say, well, I don't want that life. Then what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to just keep doing what I've been doing. Well, what have you been doing? Well, I get up, and I have my quiet time, and I pray, and, and, and I go to work, and I say nothing. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to get fired. I don't want to get thrown over some cliff. You can't wake up in the morning and say, okay, God, here I am, use me, send me. And then you go out and do your day and he goes, okay, now speak, now act. Stop and take care of that person. Oh no, I'm not doing that. You're gonna jack my whole day up. Then you show up at some church and you go, Now they're talking about that at church. I don't want this. I just want a lukewarm kind of longer nailed preacher that can scratch my ears, tell me what I want to hear and leave me alone. Then what are we going to do with these verses? What are we going to do with this book? And that's exactly what happens. Well, we don't need this book. We'll just give some platitudes and some positives and be, be positive. Be think, think positively. That'll, that, that's all Jesus wants. That's total. You know what? I I know you all hate filling the blanks, but fill in the blank. You say, but if I, if you keep reading these verses to us, and if I do this, if I live this life, then I'm going to look, I'm going to be a Jesus freak. And then people, that's, they're going to think that's what I am, and that I love Jesus, and that I love them. And no matter what it costs me, I will serve them. I will speak to them. Isn't that kind of the deal? Or I will pray for them. Or I will meet their needs. The Good Samaritan. Like, where are we? What are we doing? I'll feed the poor. I remember distinctly a homeless guy. This has been a while back. I met this guy. And I said, okay, what's going on? He says, I can't get ID. I need an ID. I can't get a job without an ID. I said, okay, what do you got to do to get an ID? I got to go down here to the city and get an ID. So I take him down there and I go in and say, he needs an ID. Well, he's going to need a birth certificate. I'm like, what? Yeah, you got to go across town to the birth certificate place and get a birth certificate. Now, guess what they told me at the birth certificate place? He got to have an ID. Now, by himself, 
this home homeless person kind of defenseless. I looked at both places. I said, look, I ain't playing your game. This man needs help and you're going to help him. I'm a taxpayer. Let me say, I said it real nice. I mean, I said it real nice. <laughs> so you don't just leave people. You don't just say, well, you, I guess God bless you. Go in peace. They'll figure it out. No, they won't. They need help. I need help sometimes. They need help. So you go to bat for people. You can't treat people that way. So when Jesus gets a hold of your life, things start to happen. Things start to change. You start, you, 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 it's not that you're trying to sound different. It's not that you're trying to live different. It's not like you're, you've been constipated and you're finally pushing him out. Does everybody that help you? Right? Oh, I'm trying so hard to let Jesus live. You just get out of the way. You, you, you just, I want to follow you, Jesus. So I'm going to deny myself, take up my cross, follow you. Let's go. And then you take a deep breath and you just start living. And all of a sudden you go, wow, Lord, you're so good to me. And that was so cool back there. I got to pray for that man. And I would never have known his wife had just died and he's going to stand there crying. And I was able to comfort him and like, what are we doing? What's next? Luke chapter 5. Another disaster story. Luke 5, 27. After these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi. This guy is scum. He is a tax collector. They hated these people. Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he left all, rose up, followed him. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. Now, who do you think, if, if Levi had any friends, who were his friends? A bunch of lunatic freaks like, like thieves like him. They're not good people. And there was a great number of tax collectors and others who, who sat down with them. He's got tax collector friends. Now, now, track with me. Well, you say, well, I met a drug dealer. And I said, hey, follow me or let, let, I'll talk to you about Jesus. And he goes, wow, would you come to my house? I'll throw a dinner for you. I'm like, yeah, I'll come to your house. And you get to the house. Guess what's in his house? A bunch of drug dealers. Why are you shocked by this? Hookers, no hookers. Strippers, no strippers. People, no people usually in their own sphere of influence. But when you care about them and they realize that, they start thinking, oh, wait a minute, I got other people need to hear this. But look what this turns into. And, the scri and their scribes and their Pharisees, the religious people, complained against his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And the question is, why don't we eat with tax collectors and sinners? We're so busy hiding out in our little forts. We build these forts protected from the world. Hope nobody comes in and contaminates the place. And then you find out, you start going, this isn't a fort. This is a prison. And the enemy has locked us in our little fort and said, if you'll stay in here, I'll leave you alone. But don't come out here to the tax collectors, the sinners, the people that are screwed up. Because if you do that, I will burn it down. So he goes, boo, and we run back into our little fort slash prison, which is just basically calculated compromise. It appears that the devil doesn't come after me if I don't go after him and his world and his people. Do you have any lost friends? Do, do I have any people? I, I have a few. I don't have enough. You say, well, but I don't live like they live. We didn't say you had to. I'm just, I'm just reading you the verses. This is what Jesus did. You go, whoa, what am I going to do with that? I don't want to do that. What are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to have another dinner party and invite all my Christian friends over. And do what? I'm, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. You got to mix it up. 
Why don't you have a dinner party invite the, the, the most evil people you know? <laughs> and you get them in your house and you love on them. And you say, look, this is why I invited you to my house. I know you. you, you know I care about you, but here's why I care about you. My life was changed, Jesus died, buried. You say, well, they're gonna run out of my house, but they're not gonna say you didn't try. Jesus answered and said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Don't run away from lost people. That's why Jesus came, and I am one of them. I was lost, but now I'm found. Now, I'm gonna tell you how messy this can get. I met with a lady recently. She grew up in a jacked up situation. She, I don't think she ever married a woman, but she had been with women, men, married to a man, just a circus. A freak show. And, and she gets it now, and she's on fire for Jesus. You go, is she in our church? You better hope so. Put your hand down. You don't have to acknowledge who it is. So we're sitting there talking. She's processing her life. And she says, you know, I have a real heart to go back to the gay community, to the lesbians, as people where I came from. Because there's so much pain. There's so much heartache. You say, well, what is she going to do? I hope she does what God tells her to do. Well, what's going to happen? What if those people come here? Then you're going to leave. Because that's what you're thinking right now anyway. I'm not leaving. Well, I'm not comfortable with their lifestyle. You know what? Maybe Jesus is not comfortable with your lifestyle either. Just because you got it all whitewashed where nobody can see the dead bones and what's really going on in your heart and in your home. What are we doing here? What's the purpose of him leaving us here? Churches should be, should be emergency rooms, not locked down facilities that screen people before they come in. You just back yourself up to the door and we'll take you in. Luke 6. Man, we're just in Luke. You're in big trouble. Luke 6, 22. Now, I am just reading you what it says in the book. You say, well, I want God to bless me. You go, okay, here's a verse for you. Blessed are you when men hate you. There we go. You want to be blessed? There you go. Blessed are you when men hate you. And when they exclude you and revile you and cast you. Out your name as evil. So they speak of you as evil. For the son of man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. <laughs> well, that's some kind of freak show. Exactly. Who would do that? For indeed your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner their fathers did, did to the prophets. We get it all backwards. We get rejected. We get excluded. We, oh, this is not fair, and they don't like me. I want people to like me. They hate you because you love Jesus. Get over it. Proof that it's working is that you're such a Jesus freak that they exclude you. They, they revile you. They, they, they hate you, and you should take that as a compliment. Now, I'm not saying go be rude or mean or do stupid stuff. But if you live this life, someone's not going to like you. Hell's not going to like you. His peeps are not going to like you. You can write down Luke 7. Read that. The Good Samaritan, Luke 10. We read that the other day. Zacchaeus is another one. Go to Luke 19. I'll just read you a piece of this. 
Another tax collector, so short he had to climb a tree to get, a, all he wanted to do is get a glimpse of Jesus. And Jesus comes up to his tree and goes, dude, what are you doing? You know, and here we go. So Luke 19 calls him down and says, I'm going to your house. Luke 19, 7, but when they saw it, they all complained saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. This is a recurring theme, a problem. Then Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore full. I'll give four times what I took from him. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, I am not saying if you meet a Christian, don't be nice to a Christian. I'm not saying if you meet another Christian, you can't invite him to church. We are not about stealing other Christians from other churches to come to this church. We are not fishing off the dock. Let's go fishing, seeking to save that which was lost. Why do you think you work where you work? You lose your job, you go, oh, it's so terrible. You know, you go, okay, Lord, I'm about to get transferred. What are we doing over there? It's a new group of people. But they hate Christians. They don't like me. I'm persecuted. Okay, welcome. Where have you been? That's the deal. But you're salt and light there, and then somebody gets in trouble, and you say, hey, can I pray for you? Or I've been praying for you. And they go, wow, that's so crazy. And then things start to happen in your life that you're praying for, and they go, wow, I can't, I can't explain this, but that you started praying for me, and something happened. I think God's working in my life. I'm like, yeah, that's what's happening. Tell me about your Jesus, because my life sucks. And you seem to have peace and joy, and you care about me, and I'm a freak. I'd rather be a Jesus freak than my kind of freak. God help us, deliver us from this church subculture crap. Where it's all about just some place to go and you can be as, please don't take this out, I'm, I'm saying it because it's what I'm saying. You can be as greedy as hell is greedy. Just like the world and come into church and go, oh, that's a bl God's blessing you. No, you're greedy. You're consumed with avarice. And, we, and we, don't, we just overlook it. I'm about to read you a verse that says we shouldn't even eat with you. And we won't run those people off. Christian people who are living, you know, say, well, uh, we're, we're not supposed to be of the world. And the world will hate you. Has it ever occurred to you that the world is in the church? You say, no, that's not the only world out there. The world sometimes is the same world in the church. And when you get all wound up, they want you gone. John 1, 11, He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. You want to feel rejected? Welcome to Jesus' world. The woman at the well, John 4, John 7, 5, for even his brothers did not believe in him. John 8, 48, then the Jews answered and said to him, do we not rightly say that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? That the worst things that could come up with to say about him. You're a Samaritan and you have a demon. Woman caught in adultery, John 8, read that story. What's he even doing standing there with a half-naked woman who had just been caught in the act? John 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. I was first. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So what is the assumption here? They hated Jesus. He picked you out of the world. They're going to hate you unless you start denying that you're one of his. So, so they don't hate you. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse two, 22. 
For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So we got some people that during our prayer time constantly take a microphone almost every Sunday and talk about telling people about Jesus. There are churches where they'd shut those people up. You're too excited about Jesus. We don't hear about all that. I'm thankful we got anybody with a story. Right? And I, and I never want to say this in a condescending way, but I'm like, look, if you're going to keep coming and you say you're following Jesus, he's going to turn you into a fisher of men. If you're fishing, you're going to catch fish. You say, well, I don't catch fish. You're not fishing. And it, you're not fishing because you're not following. Yeah, but I showed up at church. That's not enough. You can't just show up at a gathering of the church for the rest of your life. You have to be the church. Well, I just became a Christian 30 years ago. What are we doing? Let's go. Well, I don't know what to do. We're about discipleship. Well, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. You won't submit. You've got authority issues. Unteachable. Locked down. And you wonder why you have no joy and any peace. Yeah, but I read my Bible this morning. For what? What is it doing? You say, well, you're against that. No, I'm like, do something with it already. <coughs> I'm never saying don't read your Bible. Don't read your Bible just to read it. Say, okay, God, I'm going to read it, and I'm going to do whatever it says. Then your life will change. <coughs> I feel like I've left somebody out. Anybody feel left out? <coughs> Just one more. I only got a few left. So Colossians 2.20. And I didn't get into it, but write this one down too. 1 Corinthians 5. Uh, go down to like verse 9 and following. Colossians 2.20. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world... Why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. You're just keeping a bunch of rules. It's like people say, oh, but my church said you shouldn't drink, so I don't drink. Yeah, you do, you just do it by yourself. That's why you, the old joke when I grew up was you, you never wanted to play golf with one Baptist. They drink all your beer, you know, it's like. <laughs> I can tell that joke because I came from that place. It's like telling mobile home jokes. I had a mobile home. I can tell all the mobile home jokes I want to tell. Been there, done that. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. Thank you very much. There you go, that's good. And you say, well, what, wait a minute, I'm in the world. This is, these are people that claim to be Christians. This is, what, this is the mess we've gotten ourselves into. These people get away from them. Verse 
They have a form of godliness, but they deny its power from such people turn away. You say, well, but you're being judgmental. I'm just reading you the verses. You say, well, I know people like this in the church. Get away from them. You say, well, I got a problem. I am one of those people. Then get away from that, that life. Don't be that person. And then the last one I'll read you is Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13, go down to verse 10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. So there were certain sacrifices in the Old Testament that the animal was not, was not slaughtered, was not killed on the temple grounds. It was outside the camp where the tabernacle was or outside of the city. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gates. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Now, if you get outside, you're going to be treated like an outsider. You're going to be treated as an outsider by religious people. You'll be treated like an outsider by the world. You've got to get okay with that. You say, but I want to go to church and I want people to like me. You need to find a church where they love Jesus more than they're worried about liking you. Where they want to please him, where they want to please you, where they, where, where they not just after you and your money and whatever else you think they want. They want to help you get closer to Jesus. And if that means that they turn you into a Jesus freak, so be it. You can stay in the safety of the city. You say, I don't want to go out there. I don't want to go where Jesus is. Why? Because where Jesus ended up meant, meant death, meant suffering, losing his life. You say, I don't want to lose my life. You're already losing it by trying to hold on to it. So here's my last question for you. Was Jesus a Jesus freak? And the answer would be yes. And now the question is, am I a Jesus freak? Could I even be accused of that? You say, well, the people probably think you're a Jesus freak. I doubt it. You say, yeah, but you share your faith. But am I, am I so transparent? Am I so filled with him to overflowing that I can't go anywhere? Ask my wife. She'll tell you I'm not, I'm not that. She sat next to me the other day while I was on the phone with some operator, something about something again. And then I thought, oh, why is she sitting there? I could be so much meaner. <laughs> You say, well, why would you say things like that out loud? Because I'm in process. I'm not good at all this. Right? I'm, I'm learning. And I get impatient and I'm not kind. But I'm supposed to be. But I can't be by myself. So I say, Lord, I can't do this. You've got to do it through me, in me, through me. And he says, I got you. And then I'm on the phone and I start being kind to people. I'm like, but I don't want to be kind. This is the only place I had. This is, this, is my, this is my spot where I could go at them and they didn't know me until they said, so your email is rellis at reunion church. <laughs> oh, yes, ma'am, it is. My voice goes up and all of a sudden I'm a Christian again. <laughs> you know, I don't know what you're going to do. I'm going to keep pushing though. I'm going to keep challenging you, try to help you get to him, get full of him. Get overflowing with him where religious people don't want to be around you and that's a compliment and the world at some point hates you and you go, man, I think I'm in a sweet spot. It's got its tough moments, but man, this is letting him not just live in me, but through me. And it stops freaking you out because you get okay with being a Jesus freak. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you're doing. Um, 
help us to navigate these scriptures and not just read them, but go, okay, if that's who Jesus is and was and is going to be and that he lives in me, then what's going on? And for people, Lord, who are just done, they know they're lost. They don't hate you anymore. They hate that they've lost so much time and the lives they've destroyed. And they'd come to you and say, God, I'm done. I know I'm a sinner. I confess it. I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died on a cross, was buried, and raised from the dead to give me eternal life, abundant life. I accept the forgiveness of my sins, this gift of eternal life. Come live in me, through me, change me, and protect me from religious people who would put my fire out and propel me into a world just like me. My friends, my old friends now, but people who need you and help me not be ashamed of the gospel because it is powerful to save me and the people I know. So thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me today and that I am your child and no one can take me away from you and change that. And Father, for those of us, and I include myself in this, and maybe we're getting some of it right and the, the, the water's not lukewarm. Maybe it's got a few bubbles coming up here and there, but it's not, it's not hot like you like it. And you are trying to get our attention. Your kindness is what you use to lead us to repentance, the discipline, the consequence. And it's not just our lives that we're burning up. It's your life. You own us. You live in us and trying to live through us. Help us get out of the way. And let you be you through us, even if that labels us in some way in this world. So we love you. It doesn't always look like that. Um... But know our hearts, Lord, and if our hearts aren't right, change our hearts. You're the best, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. For those of you in the room, this registration card, um, an invitation was extended. We don't necessarily try to get people to come down an aisle, but an invitation was extended to accept Christ into your life. On the front of this registration card toward the bottom, there's a place there. You can, it says, I pray today to receive the gift of eternal life. You don't have to do it in here. You just got to do it before you die. <clears throat> but if that's what you did, check that off. If you don't have a pen or a pencil, tear off those little crosses in the bottom right-hand corner, fold it up, and put it in the baskets when they come by. And if anything else applies on there, check that off. If you want to sit down, if you need some encouragement, some challenge, um, we are here for that and want to help you connect with him and then learn how to walk with him. If you're not in the room, you're watching or listening somewhere, just go to reunionchurch.org. That's our website. Uh, you can send an email, though, to reunion at reunionchurch.org, and we'll get that. And just please indicate the decision you made or the questions you have, and we'd be ha happy to help you there as well. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do the offering in just a second, and then we're going to get the Jacksons up here and do a little something, and then we're going to have a reception for them in the lobby, so everybody hang tight. Um, we have uh, $1,000 gift cards for the last 10 people here. So. <laughs> Never thought about that. Maybe that's how you keep people. At weddings, they use chocolate cake. I don't know what we're going to use here. They will never cut that cake. Drives me crazy. Okay, whoever's got the baskets, let's do that. Uh, do the offering. And then we will... Do the next thing. Yeah, so I get this is all a little bit intense, right? And I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm just let's, like, let's go. And you say, well, I'm struggling. Okay, everybody's struggling. Let's figure out how to help each other and move it forward. Right? But... Let's do the deal. There's too many people out there waiting for us to show up. Okay, let's get 
any of the Jacksons that would like to come forward. All the Jacksons come forward. The whole row, as a matter of fact. They're back behind the. Am I still on? There we go. So these people have been here for 27 years. Chad has been one of our elders for almost that long. Um, recently, God transferred them way north of here. And that's not a good thing, but we're going to go with it. This is Chad and Christy. And, oh, here we go. Well, you know what? We're here. Let's do this. Pull this out. All right. And slap the water off of it. There we go. There you go. All right. And then you're supposed to drink this. Uh, yeah. yeah that's, that's, for that yeah. that's for Chad. That's for Chad. That's rose water. It's what we call a rose water. We'll put it back in there. So Chad and Christy and Kate and Hannah, and Jonathan, and Matthias, and Sophia, and Russell. And I don't know who these grandchildren are. I only go one generation. Maya, Mason, and Elliot. So none of these people existed when this all got started. There were three of us. There were three of you. And Jonathan was one of the three. How old were you, Jonathan? Six? Four? I was at least four. Four. Yeah. So... Um, <clears throat> They have been here a long time, and Chad and I have been through lots of stuff together in the life of this church. Um, some great times and some really difficult times, and I love him, and I love them. He's helped with the youth. Christy's run the women's ministry. There's so much stuff. When, when it got started, everybody had to kind of do everything. So uh, we we're going to miss them and just want to take this opportunity to honor them and their family. Um, and I know Patrick and Joseph, we all been together and just appreciate so much who you are. Get over there by your wife. There you go. Is that better? Here, let me get really close to you. <laughs> so. No, so this is the stuff that um, in a lot of ways sucks because, you know, we're just supposed to all be together until we die and that's it. But it didn't work out that way. And if God has left them here this long and is transferring them, then my goodness, wherever they're going to land up there is very blessed because these are great people and uh, they will have a tremendous impact there. So we love you. Love You're you. the best. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to let them sneak out and go out into the lobby. Uh, we have raw oysters. Uh, what else do we have? Um, broccoli. Yeah. Chocolate broccoli. broccoli of chocolate uh, fondue broccoli. Um, yeah, we serve that because no one will eat it and it will save us money. So, um, anyhow, love you. You're the best. You're the best. Ooh. All right. Love you, man. Love you, too. Anything you want to say? Uh, I could probably say a lot, yeah. Whatever you want to do. Yeah, um, well, first of all, we, you know, 27 years ago, God led us here. Um, and uh, now he's leading us somewhere else, which is really odd. 27 years is a long time. Uh, I love the, the message this morning um, because Jesus has always been the center of this church. Um, and when I would ask people, you know, what brought them to reunion and kept them at reunion, it was always Jesus. And it was the authenticity and the, the um, openness of the people here. And I think that still permeates here uh, at Reunion. Um, we are going to be praying for you guys. Uh, we're, we're not far away, so it's not like you guys aren't going to get to see us uh, anymore. Um, but uh, we're going to be praying for this church and what God's doing here because God is doing really neat things. You talk about Richard and Jesus being part of the sermon. Patrick over here, uh, whenever we're singing, he is focused on the truth, right, the gospel. Patrick works with the, the, the group here. He's not just playing music. He is really ministering to the, and discipling the people that, uh, mm. this great group of people who are, are helping us pray. So I could go through and talk about so many different people. 
And it's kind of weird because over 27 years, there's been a ton of people that we've, exactly. you know, they were the ones up here that we yeah. were feeling sad about, you know, yeah. seeing. Um, so we, all of a sudden now we're here in that spot. So anyway, thank you for Christy. All of my kids, the, the church has, um, you know, uh, because of and sometimes in spite of what happens in the church, they've really grown. And so anyway, it's a huge, this is really all about God and how God works through churches and through people and, and through families. So I just really praise him. He's a man. Yeah. All right, hold tight. All right, here we go. Lord, I thank you for this uh, sweet couple, this family. Uh, so many stories, so much history, and it's all his story, really. Mm -hmm. I pray you'll protect them, that you'll bless them. Thank you for the blessing they've been here. Guide them, use them as never before. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for the way you move us around sometimes for the sake of your body and that we, are, we don't own the ships. We are soldiers that uh, just follow orders. So thank you that they're willing to do that. Um, and uh, just thank you for being kind to us in the first place, for sending them our way. Mm -hmm. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. You're the best. Okay. Love you. Okay. Give them a chance to get out there. Uh, yeah, y'all go out in the, in the lobby. Okay. Good day. Um, let's sing up. Let's sing up. Let's stand up and we'll sing our way out of here. Um, love you guys. Have a great day. The Cowboys already won, so whew, glad that's over. Um, <laughs> and we'll see you in a, next week. Remember the anniversary? Looking forward to seeing you all there. All right, let's um, close our service with a very energetic song. Just reminds us um, that the Lord Jesus Christ is living in us. And then after we finish this song, I'll say a quick benediction and then you guys can join and I love on the Jackson family. Uh, in the